Uh, my lords, ladies, gentlemen, welcome and good morning to this meeting of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong. My name is Chris Whitehouse and my agency provides the secretariat to this group funded by the campaign organisation Fight for Freedom Stand with Hong Kong. On this call we have, uh, let, it will be led by two officers of the group, uh, possibly a third joining us shortly. We have Baroness Natalie Bennett and Alistair Carmichael MP who are the co-chairs of the group. For the avoidance of any doubt, this meeting is being recorded. It is also being broadcast by several different agencies. Um, it's being broadcast by Hong Kong Watch on their website. It's being um, broadcast on Facebook by Fight for Freedom Stand with Hong Kong. And we believe it's being broadcast globally by associated news or press, I forget which, but the big one, you know what I mean. Um, so it is being recorded and it will therefore all be on the public record. If you have questions, please post them in the chat room um, that you can find usually at the bottom of the screen with a speech bubble. If you are posting a question, please leave your name and organization. Uh, the report is now published and is on the um, inquiry website. Laura could circulate a link to that now so that everybody can access it if they've forgotten to bring it in hard copy from the printers. Not that we've printed it at all. Um, and I'll now hand over to Natalie Bennett, Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle, to introduce the report. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for so many people joining us this morning. Um, this is the launch of the report produced by the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong. We formed last year and has already become a major forum for debate and a vehicle for action on matters relating to Hong Kong. Just to be absolutely clear, its purpose is to promote democracy and the rule of law and to defend human rights in Hong Kong, to share information about Hong Kong and to nurture relations between the United Kingdom and the people of Hong Kong. Now, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, the United Kingdom has a unique legal, moral, and historical duty to the people of Hong Kong. When the UK handed over Hong Kong back to China in 1997, we also handed over the people of Hong Kong. We expected China to honor its word and legal duty to ensure those people were able to develop free and fair democratic structures and systems. We also expected that Hong Kongers would be protected by international principles of respect for human rights and that they would be both free and free from harm. The production of this 100 page report has been the result of many months of work starting back in March this year, but it simply could not have been done without the contributions of literally hundreds of brave Hong Kongers. In all, we received more than a thousand pieces of evidence, most in document or video form. We also, had, we also took some evidence using the video calls we've all uh, become familiar with as we're on now. Among the evidence from ordinary Hong Kongers, we also received evidence from humanitarian workers, from medical professionals, from academic experts, from internationally respected journalists, and also from a retired police officer. And this evidence had to be sifted and digested to build the picture that we present in this report. When we started the process, we were simply trying to establish how well the protests of 2019 had been policed, following the reports of violence we'd seen in the press. However, of course, in the last few months, we've seen a complete turnaround in the situation in Hong Kong, with the imposition of the draconian national security law and the cancellation of elections. This means that the report drafted here may only be about medical workers and last year's protests, but it's also a foretaste of what might happen to dissent, future dissenters in Hong Kong. Now, a few of you might have questions about why we focus the scope of our report so narrowly. Firstly, the APPG is not a select committee and it doesn't have the resources of its own that a select committee would have, except those offered by its outside supporters. Therefore, we had to narrow the scope simply to allow us to be able to process the information that was available to us in this age when everything's recorded. So even, even here, we had underestimated the response we get from ordinary Hong Kongers with, as we said, a thousand pieces of evidence received. Now, secondly, of course, we're not an investigative body. We don't have the power to demand testimony from witnesses. 
Therefore, we needed to limit our remit to subjects which were broader and more obvious. Humanitarian workers are protected under international law, and that protection is something that's important to all of us all around the world. So it seemed logical that the treatment of this group was both globally important and also a bellwether for how others might be treated. And sadly, the conclusion is from the information we received, it's indisputable that the Hong Kong police force has breached international humanitarian law, international humanitarian principles, and national humanitarian human rights. Moreover, as a consequence, it's breached the Sino-British Joint Declaration, the Chinese go government's contract with the British government and the British people, where these laws, principles and rights are enshrined. Now, I guess you've all got the report, but just to recap a few of the conclusions. First, humanitarian aid workers were the victims of intimidation, harassment, threats, physical violence, and were subject to arrest in violation of international laws and agreements. Secondly, first aiders bore the brunt of this abuse, but doctors and nurses were also victims. Thirdly, the treatment they received from the Hong Kong police force has had a profound effect on these humanitarian workers. They told us that in writing, they told us that in person. And this treatment, of course, affected their ability to provide future medical assistance. Fifthly, there's no evidence to suggest that humanitarian aid workers were involved in the protests, which was a key plank of the Hong Kong police forces defense of their actions. Finally, it has to be said that the actions of the Hong Kong police force towards humanitarian workers undermined and interfered with the treatment of injured protesters and affected the medical care of the population in general. However, this isn't simply a report on what happened last year. We're also providing suggestions on the way forward for actions that we believe others should be looking to take and taking. Firstly, we believe that the UK government should lead efforts to establish an independent mechanism to investigate what has happened and is happening in Hong Kong, either with the United Nations or with the International Bar Association. Secondly, we believe that the UK government should engage with a dialogue with the Hong Kong authorities to assist the UN on these issues. And crucially, a topic very much in the news at the moment, the UK government should impose sanctions on all the individuals in Hong Kong that, who permitted or enabled this to happen, including the chief executive, Carrie Lam, and the chief police officer. And we need to make sure that none of the abusers or enablers are able to come to the UK as a result of, the, of our bold and encouraging office, offer to many Hong Kongers to be able to come to live and work here. We also suggest that the UK government should look to offer training in human rights and assistance in establishing truly independent oversight mechanisms. And finally, all of the Hong Kong humanitarian workers should be considered under the purview of the Refugee Convention. Once again, before we go, uh, well, before we, I hand over to Alistair and then we go to Q&A, we would like to collectively, as an APPG, sincerely thank those people who bravely gave evidence to this inquiry. Most of us will never have to live with the, this kind of level of fear of their own government. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Juvenal asked, who watches the watchman? The answer is the brave people whose testimonies fill this report. So thank you again, everyone, for coming along. And I'm going to hand over now to Alistair to make a, say a few words. OK, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And uh, Natalie has dealt very comprehensively there with the contents of the report. You'll find the conclusions in part four and the recommendations in part five. I'm not going to cover that ground again, but just to reinforce a couple of the key messages that Natalie gave us there. First of all, I think that a, for the group it is important that we do extend the gratitude and indeed the admiration that we all share for those who have at some personal risk contributed in quite massive volumes to the evidence gathering exercise that preceded the evidence hearings and the, the compilation of this report. And I think it is worth reflecting. 
that, uh, as was told to us quite graphically by a number of witnesses, that we may look back on this period actually as being, uh, if not exactly a summer, then an autumn for human rights in, in uh, Hong Kong, because this was a relatively benign environment compared to the one uh, in which Hong Kongers now find themselves being sub uh, subject to the national security law. One of our witnesses told us that in the future they could just uh, kick down his door, take him away, and he would disappear not to be heard of again. It's worth reflecting on just the personal cost and risk that several Hong Kongers have taken, not just in their protest actions, but in contributing to this uh, inquiry. And I, I hope that we have produced a piece of work that is worthy of their bravery and commitment. Natalie touched on the narrow focus of the report. And it's worth remembering that the genesis of the exercise was uh, an evidence session, a meeting that we had in the House of Commons not long after New Year with Dr. Dr. Martin Mann. And uh, as somebody who was there, uh, I remember the impact that Dan Mann's testimony had on me. And I knew once I'd heard it, that this was something from which you couldn't just walk away. If you care about human rights and if you care about an international rules-based order, then this is something that requires attention and requires to be dealt with. It requires to be dealt with by the United Kingdom government in the ways that we uh, offer in the, the recommendations and the multilateral institutions like the various bodies of the United Nations uh, and the International Bar Association, uh, who also feature in our recommendations. Human rights and the protection of human rights has been a big part of the work that I have done as a Member of Parliament for 19 years now. But before that, uh, I practiced law for some years in Scotland as a solicitor. I started my legal career as a procurator fiscal deputy, that is a public prosecutor. So it is something that is not just political, but very personal for me, that citizenry should have the right to fair treatment and protection from the forces of law enforcement. It's the, the purpose of, of law enforcement should be there for the protection of the citizenry. There should not be something that they should be fearing. Traditionally, that idea, policing by consent, is one that was absolutely central to the operation of the Hong Kong police force. And one of the striking things that came through to me from the evidence that we heard was the way in which that policing by consent seems to have been lost by the Hong Kong police force. And that the life in, in Hong Kong is no longer the life that so many people in this country, in the United Kingdom, from which we, from where we speak to you today, uh, have known and understood it to be in the, in the past. And I think that change is something that needs to be quite clearly understood. And that matters for a whole range of different reasons, but I offer you one. I suspect that that was the understanding that some financial institutions had when they took the decisions that they took, I think in particular of HSBC and Standard Chartered in relation to the implementation of the national security law. Um, if you look at Hong Kong as we describe it today, and consider then the possible, the almost certain deterioration of that situation under the national security law, then you understand that these decisions were wrong and require an urgent revisitation by the financial institutions that took them. And that again, brings us back to the shores of the United Kingdom, another aspect in which we have to execute our historic and moral obligations towards the people of Hong Kong. Thank you, Natalie.
Thank you very much, Alastair. And um, you referred, of course, to Dr. Darren Mann, who's with us on the call and was a key informant. Um, so, Darren, um, your camera's not on at the moment because we've got some bandwidth issues, but perhaps if you can just say a, few, say a few words and just a few reflections on the report and perhaps your experiences. Thanks very much. Over to you, Darren. Yes, thank you very much. Hopefully you can hear me, if not, if not see me. Uh, I'm very grateful to the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong for having brought uh, what I consider to be extremely important matters of international concern uh, to this uh, audience and, and, and in, this, in this forum. Uh, for those of us that uh, witnessed uh, the events of the past year in Hong Kong, we appreciated that what was happening uh, w w was in many respects beyond belief. Uh, to see a, a disciplined and a professional police force seeming to act uh, with utter impunity, uh, no longer wearing uh, universal uh, uh, identifiers, uh, no longer needing, uh, it, it seems, uh, even reasonable grounds to, to arrest and apprehend uh, citizens, and more importantly, seeming to consider themselves above the norms of international humanitarian law. Uh, abusing the symbols of humanitarian protection, abusing ambulances, hospitals, and unlawfully arresting and detaining humanitarian medical workers. Uh, this was, was, was absolutely a dismaying thing to see. And I'm grateful that, that uh, the, the experiences of those uh, individuals have now been brought to the fore. But I'd ask you to consider this, that in the time that it's taken, the short time actually, and you should be congratulated for having accumulated and analysed uh, vast amounts of uh, material and evidence from thousands of, of people. But considering that time, the national security law has been passed. And that has now the following considerations. To provide first aid or medical treatment to a protester would now be considered an act of subversion. And to provide medical treatment or shelter in a hospital or an improvised hospital to a protester would now be a criminal offense of aiding and abetting terrorism. So uh, when we consider our views on what's happened in the past, uh, which I think is condemnable, let's also consider what the impact is for the future. And I think this highlights why we need monitoring mechanisms, why only accountability through transparency now, I believe, uh, can protect the freedoms uh, that Hong Kong people have a right and privilege to deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. And just a reminder that particularly the media, but anyone on the call who wants to ask a question, if you're able to put it in the chat um, with your name and affiliation, um, or if you really want to ask the question yourself in, in your own words, just put your name and affiliation with the question in there and perhaps the general area so that we can group them together. Um, and so I can begin with a question that we've got from Christine Jardine, MP. Um, we've heard that the Chinese authorities are threatening not to recognise BNO passports and status. Is this undermining the reassurance that the UK government hoped that this would provide or strengthening the resolve of those affected? Um, Alastair, perhaps if you can come in on the government side of this and Darren, if you might reflect on what you're hearing from Hong Kong on the ground. Alastair first. Natalie, apologies, I, I, I missed the start of Christine's question there. Could you repeat it? All right, sorry, sorry. Um, we have heard that the Chinese authorities are threatening not to recognise BNO passports and status. Is this undermining the reassurance that the UK government hoped this would provide? Uh, no, I think actually, rather than undermining it, it's reinforcing the need for the decision that the, the government took in relation to BNO passports. Um, would that they had taken that decision in 1997, as the late Paddy Ashton uh, then was urging them to do. Um, and, uh, you know, it does, though, I think, uh, really raise some pretty fundamental questions about the attitude of the uh, Chinese government in relation to international law. You know, the recognition of passports was where the uh, whole concept of an international rules-based order started. 
And uh, if that is something which is now to be questioned by the Chinese government, then frankly, we're in a very steep and, steep and slippery slope, which uh, nobody really wants to find themselves on. There's no winners once you start that game. Yeah, and I, I guess I would also just reflect that what we are in now is a situation where the British government really needs to think about assisting and providing safe routes for people to seek asylum. And that's something, of course, which has um, implications far beyond Hong Kong in that what we've seen with the hostile environment has very much been an attempt to make sure that people are unable to reach places where they can claim asylum, asylum that they should be entitled to. So, Darren, just over to you for the second part of that question. Um, Christine Jardine MP asked, is this threat not to recognise BNO passports strengthening the resolve of those affected? Over to you, Darren. I think it's really important to remember here, Natalie, that um, Hong Kong people have a fervent desire to protect and defend their own culture and their own traditions. And uh, many of us that have lived there, I've lived there for 25 years, and I think what we've recognised in this gradual and progressive encroachment is really an apartheid with Chinese characters characteristics against the cultural identity of Hong Kong. And I think although Hong Kong people do find some uh, relief in the prospect of being able to use BNO passports and applications for such uh, to find alternative uh, places to live, they would rather stand and protect their freedoms and cultural way of life in Hong Kong itself. There, there is no other place that can substitute for Hong Kong. And with help from the international community, with the appropriate level of supervision and transparency, many of us still believe that can be achieved. Thanks, Darren. And I see James Landale from the BBC. Lovely to see you, James. Uh, you wanted to ask a question, so over to you. Um, thank you very much indeed, Natalie. Um, my question is about Carrie Lam. The, the committee specifically calls for her to be subject to Magnitsky sanctions um, imposed by the British government. Um, those require sort of, you know, direct responsibility to be established between the individual and the alleged human rights abuse. Can you sort of, uh, uh, sort of spell out a bit more the precise responsibility that you think Carrie Lam bears for this and not just, you know, the chief of police and, and the, the nature of the police force? Thanks. Okay, well, I think, I mean, the reason why we assembled all these documents, why we put together this report is that you know, what clearly is needed, and I know when I talked to um, in the House of Lords to the government about um, uh, about Bajinsky sanctions and they talk about the need to carefully consider and, and have the evidence. And what this report does is assembles a great deal of that evidence that was out there and, and is in a form that the, the government can look at. But in terms of the direct responsibility, I think, you know, it's very clear this is something, this wasn't one day when perhaps a police force got out of control um, and acted in a way that didn't reflect its instructions. This is something that went on over a period of many months um, in which, you know, it's clearly uh, the police force is acting under the directions of the government. Um, now, of course, there is perhaps a question of, of the relationship between Beijing and Hong Kong and Carrie Lam, but as the person who has the, you know, the legal responsibility uh, there, um, I would say that that's, you know, that's a very clear line. But, you know, Alastair is the one here with more legal background, so I'll say, hand over if he'd like to make more comments. Uh, I feel I'm being set up for a fall there if I'm going to rely on, on a legal background. That's uh, uh, almost 20 years since I last put a black gown in my back in anger. Um, but, look, the, 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 you know, consider the, the picture as a whole here. We have... Um, produced uh, the report today, James, which has a comprehensive body of evidence behind it. Um, consider also the uh, statements uh, and representations made by Carrie Lam in recent months. And this comes, uh, in fact, since uh, the, probably the, the, the best part of the last year, 18 months, in relation to uh, the, the, the treatment of protesters. And uh, this comes back to the point that I was making about the standing in operation of the Hong Kong police force. This is not the uh, this is not the, the, the actions of a few rogue officers here. 
this is clearly a systematic and quite deliberate uh, change to the way in which policing is done in Hong Kong um, and which takes it to a, a model that is much more closely associated with that which we have traditionally seen in mainland China. Responsibility for that rests uh, principally with Carrie Lam and with the Commissioner of Police, who are the two people that we identify in the report, but you will see as well where the important words they are not exclusively. So um, if you like, Carrie Lam uh, is the opening bit. I have no doubt there will be others uh, in respect of whom uh, Magnitsky's uh, sanctions could be considered. That again is something that uh, the, the, the government in this country needs to take on very seriously and as a matter of some urgency. It's something that we in this country can be doing now. Thanks Alastair. And Darren, if you'd like to share any thoughts on this. Yes, thank you. I, I would like to expand on that because anyone that has seen Hong Kong society in previous years and has seen the relationship between Asia's finest, as it once was, self-styled Hong Kong police force, will have recognised that policing by consent was absolutely the model and many young people would aspire to join the police force. I think you'll find the opposite is largely the case now. But consider this, respect for professionals is part of the framework of Hong Kong. So I simply cannot accept that it was the decision of a few junior police commanders to arrest clearly identified humanitarian medical aid workers, to assault their first aid positions, to fire tear gas and rubber bullet projectiles at their improvised hospitals. I believe that this must have reflected a policy, a strategic decision making at the highest levels of government and within the police force. Uh, when a group of medical volunteers invited the police commissioner to engage in a dialogue with them uh, on matters of how cooperation could be established between law enforcement, who legitimately have uh, civic uh, order issues to address, which we understand, uh, in the regrettable uh, uh, space of violence, a uh, police uh, commissioner completely refused to engage in any dialogue. Uh, you've talked of Magnitsky style sanctions uh, of government leaders and police uh, higher order, which I agree with. But I ask you to consider this closer to home. There are many expatriate British police officers still working in Hong Kong, uh, holding uh, commander and higher level appointments, many of whom have been witnessed at the sites of these protests. And may I suggest as British passport holders, British citizens, uh, may we give them an opportunity to give an account of themselves. And that perhaps might be an important starting point for police accountability. Thanks, Darren. And I think also just to add, I mean, one of the things that I think the report brings out very clearly is, you know, some things happen on the streets in the heat of the moment. But one of the things is really telling is the widespread testimony from a number of witnesses talking about how police spoke to protesters in the most abusive nasty, sometimes very gender-based abusive terms. Um, you know, there's clearly a whole culture there. Um, you know, some of the ones that I can quote, cockroaches, vandals, brutes, bakers, and some that I won't quote that you'll find written in the report. Um, you know, there is really clearly a huge problem here that, and there's been no acknowledgement of that or attempt to deal with that, that cultural issue. So James, um, I don't know if you want to come back with any supplementaries on that or anything further you wanted to ask on that. Okay, uh, right. We've got a um, question here from Henry, Henry Dwyer. Um, the report contains lots of recommendations for the UK government, but does the APPG have any thoughts on the actions that UK civil society and institutions should take? particularly in light of the fact that various institutions such as the universities and the colleges of policing are linked to the Hong Kong police force. Uh, Henry identifies himself as a freelance. Um, just to begin on that, uh, Henry, the APPG, we actually uh, held a, um, 
a meeting with Drew uh, Pavlou from uh, the University of Queensland in Australia, um, reflecting on those very issues. And of course, we also saw, I think, last weekend in the, I think it was the Sunday Times of the Times, uh, the report that a number of British universities have been um, uh, running uh, adverts for Hong Kong police positions. And also, um, I'm speaking to you from Sheffield, and so of particular interest, we had uh, a University of Sheffield student from Hong Kong who testified anonymously uh, at that uh, event, speaking about the abuse she'd suffered and the fact that she wasn't being protected by the university authorities. So I think there is a huge um, issue here for the, for the British and other uh, universities where there's large numbers of Chinese and Hong Kong students. Um, I think also, I mean, one of my real principles and underlying ways in which I try to approach these issues is that traditionally human rights have often been used as a kind of um, weapon to use against the people you don't like. And we've ignored uh, the actions of people who are our friends and allies or even friends and allies of our friends and allies. Um, and it's really important that we regard human rights as indivisible, applying to every human being everywhere in the world. And so that's why you know, I want to talk about Hong Kong, I want to talk about Saudi Arabia, I want to talk about North Korea, I want to talk about Congo. Um, we've got to look at this as a complete thing, not just as a weapon, a stick to beat um, the people we might particularly want to, want to target with. And that means you know, everyone talking about these things, civil society, picking up all of these issues and seeing them as a holistic, uh, as, as a whole, that's something we've all got to champion. Because as we, when we think about um, humanitarian symbols and you know, the protections the medical workers traditionally get, um, that's in all of our interests for that to continue, for that to be respected around the world. And every time it isn't respected, that does real damage to all of us everywhere in the world. So Alistair, I don't know if you want to add on to that. Just add very briefly to that. I mean, we know that this is something, or the number of Chinese students that come to uh, our universities in particular, is something that is a very important part of the business model, if you like, of uh, higher education in the United Kingdom at the moment. And, uh, you know, that is, if that, um, if that uh, traffic were to, to end, then, uh, you know, that would have quite serious implications for the universities and for our own uh, domestic higher education system. I think it's worth uh, explaining, though, a little bit of the background from which uh, Natalie and, and I and the rest of the APP come from on this. Natalie's touched already on the universality and the divisibility of human rights, and that is absolutely central to it all. But our relations with Hong Kong fit into a wider picture of UK foreign policy here, uh, and specifically in relation to our uh, relationship with, with uh, China. We have particular concerns about the treatment of minorities in Xinjiang province, the weaker population, the treatment of people in Tibet and Taiwan. And Hong Kong is one part of that. Now, there are those who, for various political or uh, economic trade-based reasons, seek to isolate Hong Kong, uh, China at the moment. Let me tell you, I am not one of them. I want to engage with China. Um, because I think that it uh, profits nobody for China to become the new enemy in some sort of a reinvented Cold War. Um, but you have to be quite clear upon the basis on which we want to engage with China, and it is a basis that is underpinned by respect for human rights uh, within the country and respect for an international rules-based order uh, as part of, of their foreign policy. So it, having a, a a substantial number of uh, university students join us in higher, uh, higher education institutes is a good opportunity to build that engagement, but the engagement must not come at any cost. And I think that's where you have now seen the change in UK foreign policy in recent weeks and months. Thanks, Alastair. And Darren, if you could just uh, come in briefly and then we'll go to the next question. Yes, briefly, I just think that uh, I'd like to echo what Alistair has said and, and say that this is an opportunity, I think, for 
the Chinese government to, to re-engage with humanitarian norms and uh, the traditions of international humanitarian uh, law. And I'm hoping that that opportunity will be taken. It can surely be in no nation's interest that its medical workers are stigmatized and politically and professionally persecuted, let alone to see an underground medical system developing because the public has no confidence in the government system. Thanks very much, Darren. And Alex Crawford from Sky News, um, if you'd like to ask a question. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, apologies, because I haven't been able to go through the entire report, so I've just got the headlines. But given the um, severity of the situation in Hong Kong and the length of time this, has, this situation has been going on now, um, given the, the pro-democracy protests that went on many, for many months before we even got to coronavirus and the situation now, I wonder how disappointed the people of Hong Kong will be at, um, I'm sure they'll be very, very um, grateful at the UK parliamentary group demanding action, but I wonder how disappointed they will feel about the lack of substantial action so far and whether they will feel reassured that something like sanctions against Carrie Lam are really going to have much of an impact. And I wondered whether you would be pressing for tougher measures and perhaps um, I, I take on board um, what uh, some of the speakers have already said about engaging with China, but other uh, levers to pressure China to um, un unleash more reforms in, in Hong Kong rather than going the other way, because so far the levels of international pressure have not had any impact, absolutely zero impact so far. Um, and I, I, I mean, just talking to the Hong Kong as I know, I think they, they might feel a little bit disappointed at, that there isn't much more substantial help Okay, well, since that question sort of focused on the feeling of Hong Kongers, I'll go to Darren first to just sort of what your perspective is and what you, you're hearing. Yes, thank you. I think that question is absolutely spot on. I think Hong Kong people are looking for reassurance from the international community uh, that, that, that there's more to, to governmental positions than, uh, than statements. Uh, they, they want to see purposive action. Uh, I think there is a general sense in Hong Kong community that probably the only realistic counterweight now, counterpoise, would be for a United Nations-based solutions. And there is very popular call now for the appointment of agents, a special rapporteur and a special envoy to monitor the human rights situation in Hong Kong on the ground. Uh, this has been supported by uh, almost 80 currently serving and former special rapporteurs and envoys at the United Nations. It has widespread uh, support in the international community, but it does need to be pressed and uh, it may necessarily be uh, perhaps over the host nation's objections. After all, uh, China itself has special envoys that function in Central Africa. So why should they not accept a special envoy themselves? Second part briefly, if I may, what about, what about a universal social conscience? What about businesses, the international business community? Uh, I've written in the Financial Times really uh, with, with uh, what I'd like to reflect as, as a criticism of HSB, HSBC and Standard Chartered Banks. Banks with huge impact and presence in the United Kingdom and, and globally, and for banks like that to have approved the national security law before its content had even been published, sets an appalling example. Thanks, Darren. Alistair? Yeah, can I pick up some of this? And I think, look, Alex, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I come back to my starting point here. You know, we could have done this all so differently had we acted differently in 1997 when the, 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 the the, the problem was, was, or the seeds of it were first sown. Um, we have an historic and moral obligation towards the people of Hong Kong because of our a relationship with them historically. But, you know, what we're talking about here is not 
uh, British parliamentarians uh, wanting to uh, return to some sort of uh, imperialist past. Um, you know, uh, so uh, what, you know, we, we do recognise the, the, the responsibilities that we have uh, to Hong Kong today. And that's why, um, you know, we feel that the United Kingdom in particular has got a duty to take a lead here. Um, but the United Kingdom alone cannot take a lead here. Um, I hesitate to drop names, but as I said to Mike Pompeo when he was in London recently, uh, I'll tell an ex a sentence I never thought would pass my lips, but that's the world we live in. Um, there is a need for multilateral action here, and multilateral action requires respect for multilateral institutions, which is where perhaps the uh, conduct of the uh, Trump administration in, in recent years does perhaps weaken its position ever so slightly. But, you know, we have these international institutions, and uh, Darren refers to the need for a uh, human right, uh, uni United Nations based action, and I think he is absolutely right in that. So it, it's a bit like a game of three dimensional chess, you have to tackle it on every different level. So we have a uh, political obligations. Uh, we have financial links to Hong Kong. Uh, Dan mentioned HSBC and Standard Charter. There I mentioned that in my earlier uh, comments. And, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, these uh, institutions should be now accountable for their quite remarkable political uh, uh, interventions at that earlier stage. These are decisions that require to be revisited and reversed. And uh, we we do then need to, to work with others. It's as, it, it's as uh, you know, it's a recognition of the size of China as a political and economic force in the world that uh, you cannot hope to uh, tackle the, the, the challenges that she poses with any individual country. It will require a united uh, and concerted effort from a uh, countries who care about human rights and about the international rules-based order. But, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to human rights and international rules-based order, there are no alternatives to it. You know, you, there's no alternative model that is going to serve the world any better, and that's why we have to be prepared to support it. And just to, to briefly add to that, I haven't seen much um, linkage being made, but of course, um, all of this situation is happening in the context of the Black Lives Matter protests, where people are calling for reparations for the damage done by colonialism, by um, military adventures around the world. And you know, we're really in the same situation here, the special responsibility of the UK. This is a situation we very much created. Um, and so you know, this is, us taking the lead is, I would say, essential. But um, as both Alistair and Darren have said, it really is has to be an international effort, an international closing of ranks of people saying this is not an acceptable situation. We all need the rule of law. And I think that phrase rule of law is terribly important. And you others have reflected on the, on the behavior of various banks that have stepped in behind the, um, the Beijing government. Um, you, If you don't have a rule of law that makes commercial operations extraordinarily difficult um, and uncertain and you're in, a sh in short or longer term is really um, creating a situation where it's impossible to continue to operate under anything like what we consider as normal rules. Now I'm aware of the time and we have been going for quite some time. Um, I will try and end about 11.30. Uh, at the moment I've got one more question and Chris also had a brief point of clarification for James Landale on the, um, uh, the Carrie Lamb point. Chris, if you want to come in. Uh, yes, I don't claim to be an expert on sanctions legislation, but I just did want to pick up and refer Mr. Lansdale to the document I've posted for everybody in the chat room. There's a link to a PDF document there, which is a personal memo of explanation from Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary. The gist of the point is that the burden of proof for sanctions is different to that of criminal law, because the nature of a tyranny and a kleptocracy is that you're unlikely to find on public record that memo from Carrie Lamb to the Chief of Police constructing a change in the policing tactics so that the legislation 
based on principles of establishing accountab accountability for behavior and a deterrent to that behavior. And the test for the Secretary of State is reasonable grounds to suspect, not um, the normal burden of criminal proof. I make no comment on whether that's good or bad. I merely serve the committee. That's the document I've posted in the room for you. And it's worth bearing in mind also that uh, anyone who is subject to uh, the imposition of Magnitsky sanctions or indeed any other uh, process has recourse to putting their case in the UK courts. Um, uh, and, you know, that's if we're if we're going to preach the rule of law to others, then I think it's pretty important that we practice it for ourselves. Thanks, Chris and Alistair. Um, just a reminder, there's time perhaps for one more question if anyone wants to post it in the chat box. But in the meantime, we have a question from Baroness Hamway, uh, Sally Hamway, um, referring to the new visa for BNO passport holders and potentially their dependents, which requires a criminality check and for the applicant to be able to support themselves in the UK. That potentially requires the cooperation of the authorities in Hong Kong and of organisations who have an eye to what the authorities might expect. Um, something that I don't know, um, Darren, perhaps we can start with you in terms of reflecting on what people are saying. I'm, I'm not sure how much awareness, deep awareness there is in Hong Kong of what the rules are and how difficult it might be. I've certainly seen lots of social media comment from people noting those kind of difficulties. But Darren, if you, if you wanted to sort of react to the situation many might find themselves in. Yes, uh, should uh, risk of repeating myself, should say that I think the vast majority of Hong Kong people, of course, do not want to leave. They want to, they want to defend their home. They want to preserve and restore their, their cultural uh, uh, identity and traditions. But um, the circumstances may, of course, change and, and, and uh, uh, citizens recognise that. Uh, what I can say is that inquiries to, to agencies dealing with immigration have never been uh, so, so high. Uh, a lot of people were taken by surprise to find uh, how widely the possibility of a BNO route uh, might prove to be. It was thought to be restricted, of course, to those that had that document in place before 1997. Uh, but now applies to their uh, descendants and perhaps even uh, with, with looser links than that and considerations for, for others. Uh, one of the great fears that you've seen recently is that there may be a Chinese action actually to de-recognize the BNO passport and essentially trap those people uh, within Hong Kong. And I would say that's caused great concern uh, indeed, uh, more so than uh, perhaps evidentiary needs to prove that they, for example, do not have a criminal record. Thanks, Darren. Alistair? Yeah, well, look, I mean, the, the thing about a passport is that it titles you to uh, travel. It doesn't require you to travel. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, the, the support that we can give uh, to uh, BNO passport holders and the route to, to citizenship, if they then wish to uh, come here, is important. And it's important also that it shouldn't be undermined by being made firstly overly bureaucratic or secondly only accessible to those who have the financial means to uh, benefit from it. Um, many of those who are most at risk uh, are those who are the younger people who were out in the streets uh, in Hong Kong protesting and by definition younger people tend not to have the same financial means as those of us who have been around a few years although my own bank manager might uh, question that. Um, uh, you know, younger people are the people who are most vulnerable. They're the people who need the protection. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that the, uh, the vault fast that you have seen in UK foreign policy recently is, is going to be, uh, or it will have a momentum that is maintained and it won't doubt now become uh, bogged down in, uh, in in bureaucracy, or indeed, uh, as has been the hallmark of, of uh, immigration policy under the Conservative government, uh, the placing of financial barriers in people's way. Um, I think there are probably things that we could be doing proactively to make that information available in uh, the uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, I would like to see the UK government opening up more offices and shops to uh, make the, the, 
the, the access to that route to uh, citizenship open to people if they choose to, and making sure that uh, the, the obtaining and holding and maintenance of b &O passports is something that's straightforward and it, it shouldn't be a chore. Thanks, Alastair. And just to reflect on that, it's something a number of meetings that the APPG has held. Um, there's been a lot of reflection on the issue of, of socioeconomic status and indeed age. I mean, it is really striking to me. Um, I spend quite a lot of time with climate strikers here in the UK, many, most of whom who are under the age of 18. And of course, that reflects uh, quite a few of the people who've been on the streets, large numbers of people who've been on the streets in Hong Kong. Um, and also, you know, we tend to have an assumption that um, everyone is able to speak um, fluent English and is able to access materials in English. And of course, that's not necessarily true. So we've really got to think and make sure this is not a situation where people with, with large amount of access to financial resources, um, you know, are able to reach safety and others are not. It really does need, need to address those kind of equality issues. We've got probably one final question here. Um, and this is from Angel Quan from the Apple Daily in Hong Kong. Um, do you think the humanitarian situation in Hong Kong will be worsened after the national security law was imposed? Darren, again, perhaps if you could start with that, of, of what's your impressions of, will the, the national security law worsen the security situation? I, I, I think it's certainly going to be different. As you can see now, the very act of demonstration or to seek to to promote participatory governance uh, through through uh, a presence on the streets is is now unlawful. So I don't think that we're going to see perhaps a wide scale street protest in the way we did. But I think what's concerning is is what does it drive underground? What now is going to happen that's not, that's not going to be within the uh, lenses of the press that are accompanying the demonstrations? I think we're worried about, about the dark side now. Where does this go? I've already alluded to an entirely underground hospital system where volunteer medical workers, doctors and nurses actually establish hospitals in apartments, in churches, in, in, in basements, in disused factories. Uh, what's going to be the consequence now of, of a continued and progressive loss of faith and trust in the in in the government thanks darren and i think i mean it's worth reflecting on the um the fact that of course we've seen the um the, the postponement perhaps cancellation of the elections and looking back to the district council election results from last year which very clearly showed that there is a huge public desire for democracy, for human rights in Hong Kong. Um, and now, you know, even that um, peaceful, legal, simple method has been closed off. And I'm afraid you know, COVID-19 is an excuse simply won't wash. Um, you know, the, the United States, uh, possibly despite the president, is going to hold an election this year. There are perfectly possible mechanisms to do that. Um, and so you know, when you close off, you know, not only close the streets, but also close off the route of the ballot box, um, then that's creating a very difficult situation. Although I think I do have to reflect on the incredible bravery of people who we have seen through social media and media reports you know, on the streets, you know, arrested for the simple act of holding up a blank sheet of paper, the simplest possible act you could imagine. And indeed people we've heard arrested for, um, for simple social media posts. Um, it's obviously a hugely difficult and very unstable situation. And you, I both have huge respect and huge worry for so many people who have, have been and then continue to be so brave. So I think we've now been going for an hour, which I think is, is quite a long time for a press conference. So what I'm going to do is, is hand over to Alastair to, to finish us off to if you, any final comments or any reaction you want to make on that question or anything you want to say to finish off. Thanks, Alastair. Just very briefly, Luke, um, I don't want this report to be seen as a council of despair. Um, it's a very detailed explanation of what has happened, uh, and it is a detailed explanation of what has happened that is rooted in the bravery and testimony of those who were prepared to go out onto the streets to stand up for human rights and to stand up for democracy and accountability in the first place. And that, I think, is where there has to be a measure of hope in this whole message. 
And it is that there are so many people of such enormous courage who care so much about democracy, about human rights, about international law. And it is their bravery that really requires our action. And it demands our action as a country and as an international player. As a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, um, the United Kingdom has particular opportunities and particular obligations to call out what is happening in Hong Kong for what it is and to act, and to act with other countries. There is no individual country holds the answer to this problem. It, you can see from the events of recent weeks even, including the cancellation of elections, that the direction of travel is still a dangerous one. But this is a fight that can be won, and it will be won because of the courage and the commitment of the people of Hong Kong themselves who have contributed to this piece of work that we publish today. And that is why I am not just grateful to them, I am absolutely in awe of them and what they do. And for as long as they are prepared to fight for the, what they believe in, then those of us in the all-party group in the United Kingdom Parliament will be with them every step of the way. I hope they understand and that that message is heard loud and clear today. Thank you very much, Alastair. Um, some very powerful words there uh, to reflect on. It just finishes to me to, to wind things up to say thank you very much to everyone who's given their time to come along this morning in the time zone that I'm sitting in anyway. Um, thank you very much to the Secretariat team who's done an enormous amount of work and continues to work. Um, you know, do watch out um, for more events coming up from the APPG. Uh, we may have a little, a week or two's break over the summer, but we're, we're likely to be back soon. Um, uh, thank you for all of that work. And, you know, I can only finish by echoing the words of Alastair and saying thank you to everyone who contributed to this report. We've done absolute best to protect everybody, but simply by doing that, they've taken a risk, they've taken a stand, and we can only say thank you very much to that. Thank you, everybody, um, and have a good day wherever you are in the world. Thank you.